Hi, my name's Sam Hughes. I go to Mount Wanganui College and I'm interested in sciences, health, and so today I'm going to check out what it's like to be a public health doctor. Today, Sam meets Dr Neil DeWitt to get the inside information. Hi, oh, Sam. I'm Neil. Thanks for joining us today. Do you want to come through? So what is it exactly that a public health doctor does? Sam, a public health doctor looks at health at a population level. Yep. So we're interested in things that affect the health of the communities for which we're responsible. Public health doctors can specialise as medical officers of health. Medical officers of health are involved in managing infectious diseases in the area, so we get notified of cases of measles and whooping cough, for example, and we're involved in trying to promote strategies for immunisation to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. OK, so I'm throwing you in the deep end. We've got a meeting arranged with the planning and funding team of the Bay of Plenty District Health Board. OK. The purpose of this meeting is really just to provide them a brief of what we're likely to expect this winter with pandemic influenza. Yep. As a public health doctor working for a public health unit, Neil plays a critical role in the well-being of the region where he works. At the moment, he's involved in managing our current influenza, H1N1 or swine flu pandemic. This meeting is about giving advice to health professionals and preparing for a potential second wave of the virus. Many of you were involved with last year's pandemic response, so we'll be quite familiar with it. And as you'll probably be aware, we are expecting a second wave. We know from the 1918 experience that the pandemic came in three waves. There was a small, smallish first wave and a very large second wave in which possibly about 40% of the population became involved within an eight-week period. And then there's a smaller third wave a couple of months later. Now we know the danger. What do we do when a second wave hits? Sam, this is our emergency operating centre, or ERC. It's the room from which we coordinate any emergency response to a health issue. I'll be giving advice on what's happening internationally, what's happening nationally, and also looking at you know, how infectious the organism is or the virus is and what we should be doing in terms of our local response. Dave has been a teacher help at a kid's diabetes camp and on his return has been confirmed with swine flu. It continues to be dangerous for those who have existing conditions like asthma and people with weak immune systems. Also, at least half of the population don't yet have immunity to it. Sam needs to help stamp out the disease by tracing the people Dave's had contact with. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm from calling from the Bay of Plenty uh, Public Health Unit. We um, believe your child has been in contact with influenza. Contact tracing is a process that we look at when that person was infectious, identify those people that had had um, close contact, and then provide um, advice on, for example, immunisation if it's a vaccine preventable disease or treatment. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks for doing all that, Sam. That was very well done. Excellent. Sam's phone calls are one-on-one, -on -one, but in an emergency, Neil coordinates a response with agencies across his region, like other health organisations, regional councils, civil defence, St John's, etc., and links to national agencies that coordinate the national response. They also have the power to turn places like this into community-based assessment centres, or CBACs, for large numbers of sick people. If we had a, a, a large a pandemic with a lot of people getting sick, we could get up to 40% of the population becoming ill within uh, four or five weeks of each other. So a CBAC provides the same type of service that um, patients will get from the GP, but focused on influenza. This is a pretty massive building. How do you get it all ready for that many people? We've got a number of these facilities available around the Bay of Plenty region and we can set them up pretty quickly. Um, from the time of deciding to set them up to having them fully functional, we can, it's probably about 24 hours. That's what we do in an emergency, but how do people get sick in the first place? Public health doctor Michael Baker is involved in research and epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of how often diseases like swine flu occur in different groups of people and why. Michael involves Sam in a survey for the current influenza pandemic. As a public health doctor, I've developed the questionnaire and then a number of staff will go into the field and use it. Last year, um, to which um, age bracket do you fit? Uh, 20 to 29, 30 to 39? Epidemiologists try and answer some quite simple questions. Um, who gets sick? Why do they get sick? And what can we do about it? How many were boys 5 to 17 years of age? Two. The things that got me really started in this area was um, seeing people get sick with preventable illnesses. And with, um, by making a few changes, 
uh, we can promote health more effectively, we can create safer, healthier environments. And over winter, was your house or flat colder than you would have liked? Is it yes, always, often, sometimes, or not at all? Often. Often, OK. Why are you asking questions about my house when we're talking about the flow? Well, that's a good question. Um, one of the aims of the study is also to look for uh, risk factors for getting flu. And we're particularly interested in whether housing conditions such as household crowding, dampness and mould might be risk factors. The raw data from surveys like this is used to help fight the disease. And the public health research that Michael carries out helps make informed decisions on what public health action our communities need to take to keep well. We're going to use the information to try and identify ways of preventing the second wave or reducing its impact. In my own career I've had several opportunities where a relatively small change in policy has prevented a large number of people getting sick. So if you look on the screen here, you can see this is what we call the epidemic curve. So this is showing the incidence of cases over time. And you can see the, the first wave of the pandemic was quite severe and happened over around 12 weeks. The bulk of people who got this infection were young children and infection rates drop in older age groups. That was why we were asking about children under five in the house. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, uh, household crowding, and particularly the numbers of young children, is very important as a risk factor for getting influenza. You know, little children have um, fairly poor hygiene and everything's covered in mucus. Uh, they also have lots of very close contact with other children. So, how did Sam do? Is his enthusiasm infectious? Oh, Sam did really well today. Um, I think it, it was an interesting experience for him to be involved and it was great to have him along and to be able to share some of what we do. I think it's quite cool how you're not just dealing with one person's health but a whole, an entire population's health and um, I think that would be quite rewarding as a job and I think this would be a good job for me. To become a public health doctor you'll need to first become a qualified doctor. You will then need to do specialist training for four years with the Public Health Medicine Training Program, which involves work experience and completing a Master's in Public Health. It may seem like a lot of training, but most doctors say the study flies by and the career opportunities are tremendous. More Māori and Pacifica people are needed in Public Health. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.